Oh, Jesus Christ, we give you all the praise and the glory right now. Lord, we lift up what you're going to do in this city and the cities. You know, we've got that conference at the beginning of February, and there'll be a lot of pastors and different people coming that I haven't met before even here in the city. I can tell you when they come and encounter this power, God is also going to start to open up doors in this city. So you must, as individuals, say, hey, we want to, we want to run ahead with this. We want to join this. We want to be part of this end time revival that's not about prophets, that's not about anything else other than the name of Jesus being lifted up because there must be a genuine in this hour to expose the false. Hallelujah. So Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you will just come right now and fill us with your anointing, with your power in the name of our Lord Jesus. Now, if that is too loud, where you're sitting, I can try turn it down. Is, are you right? Yeah, right. I saw you go like that and I thought you might have a headache or something. No, okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And hallelujah. So, Lord, we just thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So, today's title is The Devil's Plan is to Destroy the Church of Jesus Christ. That is his plan. Hallelujah. But Jesus has a plan. And he said, according to his word in Mark chapter 3, he said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not, what? Shall not prevail against it. So God has a plan, but Satan has a plan also. So we must understand the plan of the enemy. So the devil's number one target is to destroy the church. If he cannot destroy it, then he will subtly come in to influence us and to bring other tactics like offense. If you are getting offended by little things, then you must say to yourself, there is a spirit of offense over me. You must be honest to say, hey, I can now understand this is a tactic of the enemy, that offense that I'm getting offended all the time, it's not the person's fault, it's actually with you. And the devil is around you that is creating confusion for you to be about every, angry about everything else so that you're not effective in the kingdom of God. Maybe it might be discouragement. You feel discouraged. That's also a ploy of the devil, a scheme of the devil to make you ineffective in his kingdom. It might be false teaching. If you are now chasing after false teaching, that is a ploy of the devil to come and shift you away from the truth so that you will be ultimately ineffective in the kingdom. You will not bring revival with false teaching. False prophets cannot bring genuine revival. Only Jesus Christ and the preaching of his cross and him and lift it up. Divisions. The devil comes to bring divisions in the church of Jesus Christ. If we are divided, then we will not fulfill the scripture when he says, Father, as I am in you and you in me, let them also be one, that those that see them may see that they are one and may know that I was sent by you. When we are divided amongst ourselves, that is a plan of the devil. Distractions. When you get distracted by things that takes you away from God, it takes you away from God, then you won't be effective to where God wants you to be. So as I travel the nations, I hear many stories of many people and they will share their, of, the, of the problems of the church that they left. Now some of those people have cried out as in why pastor is these things happening in the church? These are to fulfill prophecy. But the point is, are you going to allow those things to affect you or are you going to arise and say, God, I'm going to be separated from this stuff so I can be used by you in this hour. 
God wants to use people that will make themselves available. Don't just come along for the ride, but not actually be a doer of what's happening. Don't just come to be a voyeur, but come to participate. Come and be a person that God can use in this hour. But what we see is as I travel, the tactics of the enemy to destroy the church, the church is unaware. So let's see, there is a lack of understanding in churches of the importance of spiritual warfare. The church has failed to recognize the schemes of the enemy and he is a real enemy and they have no plan to respond to that attack. It's like an enemy has attacked your house, but you have no way of defending yourself from that attack. <coughs> I come across many people, as I said, that have left churches. Maybe it was a personality problem. Maybe it was a power struggle going on in the churches. Whatever it is, the truth is, wherever you have people, there will be a striving because there is imperfection in people. Hallelujah. That's why we don't look to people, but we look to Jesus Christ. And when we abide in Him, He will abide in us, then we will be able to abide with each other. But if you don't spend time in prayer, in the Word of God, and those things, how can you abide with each other? You can't because you're not bonding from the same spirit and you're playing into the hands of the devil. And then you wonder why you get offended all the time. Or the situation that comes, you're playing into the hands of the devil. We must be effective because our tactics and what God wants us to do is above our feelings. That's why we don't go by our feelings. We go by faith. We don't go by sight. We go by faith because everything is spiritual. Everything around us is spiritual. And when we go through this teaching today, you will start to understand. So Matthew 16. Verse 18, the last part, says, I will build my church and the gates, which means the forces of hell, shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. This is a promise Jesus Christ has given to the church, no matter how fierce the attack is of the enemy. He says, you will prevail. But if you don't know the schemes. If you don't know the devices of the enemy, how are you supposed to defeat the enemy? Isn't it? So we must expose them today. And that is my purpose today. As I was on the plane for the last five hours, writing this message, not being interrupted by anything else, just focusing on that. There was no entertainment. It was just writing this message the whole way through. Hallelujah. So we have hope in these words. But we must also recognize the enemy is viciously, strategically coming against the church and he doesn't want to see the church win. Right. Hallelujah. He doesn't, he doesn't think that the church is going to win, by the way, because that's what happens. Pride comes in. It clouds your judgment. It clouds your judgment thinking that you are right and the other person is wrong. And that is what the devil thinks inside of himself. Why does it seem that so many churches have problems of all different kinds? Why? Because the devil and demons also go to church. You might find that hard to understand or hard to fathom, but the truth is it happens. And we will expose it today. We will break it down today that you can also relate to it in your life and how the devil does everything to distract you from being effective. He may not be able to distract you fully from coming to church, but he can still operate even in the church to distract you from being effective. So this may come as a surprise to many, but it's the truth. And maybe we can look at the following reasons. Have you experienced on a Sunday morning 
We call it Sunday morning wars within your family. You're preparing to come to church, or maybe even on a Saturday night. All of a sudden, all hell breaks loose within your marriage, within your children, within everything that's trying to stop you from going to church. Now, if it's not effective in stopping you from going to church, and when you come to church, you say, praise the Lord, but really you've just come from a war in your household that you don't want your pastor or anyone else to know what's been going on. So you come to church, but the devil is also waiting there for you in the church to distract you that you would also come into his devices to not be effective. Therefore, when you leave, you're not a doer of the word, but you're still offended. You're still divided. You're still disappointed. You're still discouraged. These are all plans of the devil to keep us from what? from being effective. Hallelujah. So, before heading to worship in your local congregation, wherever it is, so why is it that before service that everything goes wrong? Maybe the kids start to cry. Maybe the car doesn't work. Is this familiar? Am I speaking to us? We have certain things that are coming against us all of a sudden. If you have also had parents, you remember your parents would have an argument before because the devil didn't want you to go to church with the right heart. He wanted you to go with a hard heart, with an offended heart, so you wouldn't even be able to hear the word of God to bring the breakthrough in your life. And it doesn't end. When we reach the church, we reach that friendly environment where everyone puts on a mask and says, Praise the Lord, brother. Hallelujah. How was your week this week? It was fantastic. Thank you for asking. Oh, how I love my church. And we reach there in the confines of the church fellowship. But even there, it can intensify we're going to recognize it today so we can understand that we must know our enemy and how to fight against it. So isn't it interesting how a child will cry at a certain time, even in the message, to distract you from being able to hear the word of God? Children are children, they will cry. But sometimes it's interesting, as though a demon came up and pinched that child to make it cry at an important time for you to hear the word of God and to distract you and bring you out of the church. This is just one. Well, what about the use of modern technology? This is common. All of a sudden, the computer doesn't work. All of a sudden, there is a power, power blackout that even happened here before this meeting tonight. Why is that? Because it is a plan of the devil to bring a distraction, even though technology can be good, when you go to places and you're so used to using technology and you're so used to air conditioning, when the power goes out, the people become distracted and they can't even hear the word because they just like to be entertained. Or you're worshipping and someone changes the lyrics and they're a different lyric to what you should be worshipping. These are not just human errors. These are little ploys that come into the church to distract us from getting our breakthrough. Or you're doing a revival meeting in a place and you're relying on a generator or the electricity and all of a sudden it breaks down. The handle breaks off or it is not kicking over to be able to have the projection to get the message across. These are schemes of the devils to stop and hinder the work of God. Hallelujah. It is probably safe to say that the enemy is hanging around, waiting to cause problems. He's just waiting to cause any problem he can to what? So that we will not be effective. So he will create confusion. He will create divisions, misunderstanding, discouragement, offense then he has effectively gotten the church off track and has won a great 
victory. All too often the church has forgotten about the enemy's concern over what we do. And in our ignorance, we allow him to create problems in the church. So what does the Bible say? 1 Peter 5, 8. Be self-controlled and alert. In other words, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is just waiting, people. He is waiting to get you off guard. If he can't stop you from going to church, he will make sure that you don't receive what you should do to live to be victorious throughout the week. There is a very real reason that demons go to church. There's a very real reason for it. The Bible presents a picture of a great cosmic battle going on between the forces of God and the forces of Satan. And we can see that in Matthew eleven twelve, 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. You know, when you are focused, when you go to a place and you're on a mission and you, you, you say, I'm not going to allow anything to distract me or take me off the course for what I need to do in this place. You're focused. But if you just casually come in, the enemy can put in a disruption, something like that, to rob you of your peace so that you will not be what? Effective. So Christians are people who have changed sides and are now on God's side in the battle. That means prior to Christ, you were actually on the enemy's ground. You were working for him. Even if you didn't know it, you were working for the enemy. But now when you come to Christ, when you become born again, you're now enlisted in God's army. Hallelujah. We can see that when Paul writes, according to the word, in Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 2. And it says, and you were made, and you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's the Antichrist spirit, the prince of the air, which is Lucifer, which is Satan, that is operating within churches with his military power. And it says here in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. So you're now transitioned from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of Satan, to the kingdom of God, from the army of Satan to the army of God. God has made a way for us. Hallelujah. So we have transitioned. So the enemy of our God has also become our enemy. Can I say that again? The enemy of our God has also now become our enemy. Because according to Psalm 139 verse 21, it says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee, and am I not, am I? And am not I grieved with those who rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. We are talking about the spiritual forces. We are talking about Satan and his army of forces. See, when Christians gather together in unity as a church, we become a real threat to the devil because he's just waiting. He's scared that we will arise in one voice, in one spirit, in one faith, and declare war on the devil. So our purpose is that we are there 
what we come to church for. We come here to worship. We come here to pray. We come here to teach. We come here to instruct. We come here to encourage one another to live a proclaim the kingdom of God within our lives. And Satan will do all that he can to prevent us from what? Being effective. And for this very thing from taking place. The real danger for us is our being unaware of the enemy's schemes, of his devices. We seem to act as if difficulties in church are just a natural thing. But they are spiritual. The things that are happening in church, I can tell you, when I was in East Timor, I was about to give a message that they were going to put on the television. The blackout came just when I was about to preach. It was an attack on the devil. The people were so comfortable with air condition. Now no air condition. Now no music. So what happened? The people started to talk at the back. So therefore, my voice, that even though I can get a loud voice, it was distracting the people and bringing confusion for them receiving the word of God. I think I preached the best I have in my whole life, but I didn't have a microphone to preach. But the people, because of the enemy's plans, they played into his little trap and didn't understand that they needed to pray. Because they thought this is just natural. It happens all the time. No, it is not natural. It is spiritual. And the devil did not want that message to be released. So we need to understand that there is one obvious thing about Satan's attacks on the church. And that is, he is consistent. He doesn't give up. He will keep coming. He will keep coming back. He will keep trying to visit you in dreams. He will keep trying to come into your house. He is consistent. He doesn't give up. Like the Energizer battery, the bunny that goes, it doesn't give up. But Christians, as soon as offense comes, as soon as a little bit of misunderstanding comes, we give up. We get discouraged. We give up. Someone spoke to us a funny way. We give up because our focus is not abiding in Him. And that's where the divisions come in. Many other things. So basically, he does basically the same thing over and over and over and over again. When you repeat something, as Robert will know, when you do something and you perfect that thing, it's because you do it a thousand times. When you do something a million times, you become very efficient in that thing. How much more is Satan that has done it over and over and over and over again? But we are playing into his hands because we think those things are just natural. They are spiritual. And we also need to be steadfast in our faith to be consistent that we may also do it over and over and over. When does the warfare start? It starts now. When does it finish, Pastor? Not to the dead. Because you've joined the army of God. Job 1.7 says, The Lord asked Satan, Where have you come from? In response, Satan answered, the Lord from wandering all over the earth and walking back and forth throughout it. And he says, have you tested my servant Job? Meaning he was going to and forth. The Bible says that Satan's ploy is to come and weaken the nations. He wants to weaken them in sin, in offense, in divisions. Divisions doesn't just start in the church. It starts in the family when marriages are broken. In many 50, 60, 70 years ago, you would not have heard of divorce. Today, it is just accepted even in the church. And prophets are saying, I can prophesy, I see your third husband coming. What is going on in the church? But pastor, you don't understand. I'm not... What I'm 
saying here, it's something for us to review and look at and say something is wrong. Something has gone wrong. Something has gone wrong in the house of God. And then the same prophet says, okay, I see you marrying this person. And the person that he's prophesying is in just currently in a divorce, leaving that wife. And then six months later, gives the same prophecy that the other person's going to marry someone else. Does God change his mind? He is not a God of confusion. We've got to understand the spiritual battle. Today, it just seems to be in marriages, we are so easy to give up, to hang up the gloves and say, it is too hard. You don't understand, Pastor. Don't you understand that the devil is real? He's going to come after your marriage over and over and over and over again. If you don't understand his schemes, if you don't understand, how will you be able to fight him? There's so little offense today. I don't like that person. The Bible says we are coming in those days where people will be easily offended. That's right. And we're playing into the devil's hands. Because it's also happening in the church. It's happening in the church. Hallelujah. So what is some of those signs that Satan comes to destroy the church? Let me just look at one. Hopelessness. You know, it's easy to get to that point of feeling hopelessness. When you as a pastor or you have been working hard and you've given it everything. But nobody's changing. Nobody's changing. Maybe the results, you're not getting the results that you first expected. The church is dying, but unwilling to change. So it brings a real battle of the mind, where the devil says things like, what's the point? Why don't you just give up? And you start to believe in those things. You start to believe, you know what? I might as well just give up on this marriage. There is no point going on. There's no point. I must give up on this job because there's no point. I must give up on this church because there is no point. That's what the devil does. He comes to bring hopelessness to you that there is no other way to get out of that situation other than quitting. And he has just won the battle because he's so good coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back. The devil wants to destroy the church. What's another way? Discipleship distraction. What is that? Means the enemy delights in churches that have no strategic or effective strategy to disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning we get caught up in other things and we lose the heart of the mission of the vision which is to evangelize in your workplace. Where does it start? It starts with your loved ones. Who are your loved ones? Everybody around you. Are we witnessing to them? It starts with them. Our loved ones. No plans on teaching their churches of or believers how to wear the full armor of God. Meaning spiritual warfare is not being taught today in the nations. All they do in their prayer meetings is come with their little shopping list and then they feel good because they've had a little bit of fellowship. But there is no change because they don't know how to press through and pray until God moves. That is the church today in many of the nations. The full armor of God, Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God. Learn to stand. And when you've done all, stand. Keep on standing. Don't give up because the devil's going to come back and back and back and back. It will never finish until you build up your spiritual muscles to say enough is enough in the name of Jesus. I'm not budging this spot. 
I'm not going to allow the oppression. I'm not going to allow the discouragement. I'm not going to allow the offense. I'm going to stick in this marriage. I'm going to stick in this situation. I'm going to stick in this church. I'm going to stick in my mission. I'm going to stick into my job until the day is done. Hallelujah. Even if all hell is breaking against you in the workplace. They were trying to get rid of me in a workplace. They did everything to get rid of me. And God said, no, I'm not finished with you yet. And I stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed. Until one day they said, hey, uh, we've got some bad news for you. Um, we have to let you go. But here's your severance pay. Hallelujah! They didn't know how happy I was. I said, God bless this company. Hallelujah! Because I stay, I stay, I stay, and I receive my reward. Hallelujah! Within a week, I had a new job that was double the pay, double the promotion. Because my trust was in God. Don't give up, no matter if there's witches, no matter if they're all against you. Because the devil won't stop people. But pastor, since I've come to Jesus, why has all these difficult things taken place? Because you've gone from the army of Satan to the army of Jesus Christ. You're in the army. You were not even a threat before. Now, he wants to play you in his hands through his schemes. If he can't stop you from coming into his kingdom, he will stop you from being effective in God's kingdom. And that's what it is today. There is a big facade in churches just because you attend this church. Oh, that's such a good church. Got so many programs. But where are the people being delivered and set free? We call it the next strategy is the devil wants to destroy the church, giving them a false security in transfer growth diversion. It's a diversion. Where a church, just because it has a certain name, will come and plant a church in your city because they have all the modern worship and they say, hey, we ain't going to sing in this church this is the day that the Lord... Had. No, no, no. We don't sing that. We only sing the modern things. That's what they do. But that old song, This is the day and how great they are, they still carry an anointing today. And if the Holy Spirit says, I want to sing this song, I'm obedient, I will sing that song. Because it will carry an anointing of God to break the yokes of bondage. A postmodern church today is ineffective against the enemy's kingdom. The devil is seldom threatened when churches grow only by swapping sheep with other churches, maybe across the city, maybe even down the road. Don't be deceived, people. These churches, just because they have all the big names come to them, it doesn't mean anything. And if you have money, they will receive your wealth. No. It's about preaching the truth. It's about praying for our loved ones. I was with a pastor in the Philippines. I couldn't believe this man. I said, look, there's 20 people contacting me. I've given them your number. I hope you don't mind. And then that went to 30 people and beyond. And he followed up every single one. And we met those people. And he says, I'm going to go to their loved ones. I said, I've never met a pastor like you before. I want to work with you. He is not one of those big mega church pastors. But he has the heart of God. And God will use him to reach the loved one. But we like to go to the big churches because we just come and we go. We don't even have to say what's really going on. But this pastor will come into your house and break the strongholds of the enemy. That is the purpose of the church of Jesus Christ. But pastor, and then all it is, all they're preaching is about their church. Oh, my church is this, my church is that. What are you doing for the kingdom of God? Don't worry about Pastor Robert. When was the last person you evangelized, you prayed for, you asked that demon to come out? That's the 
That's what it's about. It's about encouraging each and every one of you to stand on the Word of God. But you can't go unless you are abiding in Him. Otherwise, the enemy will come and attack you. It's a real fierce, vicious battle out there in your workplace, in your relationships, in your family, in your marriage, in every area, even in the church. Are you willing to fight the battle? Or are you just going to give up? The next strategy the devil wants to destroy the church is having this self-dependence mentality. In actual fact, some churches I've been to, I would agree that even if God's presence left, they would still run because he wasn't even there in the first place. How can you even walk without the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit doesn't go with me on these missions, I say, God, it's better for me just go back and get a full-time job. God must come. He must come with us. Moses said, I don't want to go anywhere unless you go with me. Because he knew that he was useless. He knew that Israel was rendered powerless without the power of God. But with God, it didn't matter. The enemy... It didn't matter their military power. It didn't matter who their generals were or their experience in war. If God was with them, they would destroy them. And the enemy, you know, the Bible says that the devil believes and they tremble. How many believers today actually tremble at God? Do you tremble that God you serve will wipe out the enemy? The devil has no right over us. As believers, but today we casually allowing him to come in subtly in our churches, in our homes, in our relationships, and God is saying, Arise, church! Though the darkness may cover the earth, though the darkness may creep upon the people, he says, Arise in this hour, fight the good fight of faith, because the devil wants to destroy us. The Bible says, Psalm 127, verse 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builder builds it in vain. The Bible says it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the power of the Holy Ghost. Are we abiding in Him? I don't know about you, but I'm more on fire now than I was in the Philippines. Because I knew when I could go home, I can teach the Word of God. Hallelujah. See, when you're on these missions, you're preaching. But when you come back home, you can teach, hallelujah, so people can become disciples of Jesus Christ. That they will also go to the nations. No limit. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is operating in our lives. The same power working in Benny Hinn. The same power working in all those men of God. That same power is available to us. And I won't even ask you a cent, hallelujah, free of charge. And I'll even go to your loved ones, even if it's out of our way, because that's what Jesus did. The same power is in you. You can destroy the works of Satan. Arise, church. Arise, church. What is it? The devil wants to destroy the church, and he will use doubt and deception. Sowing doubt and deception has been one of the devil's weapons from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. He deceived Eve by saying to her, he said these words, he was more or less saying, did God say to you, really, that you couldn't eat of this tree? Putting doubt in her mind, essentially saying, you must not eat this? Did he say you couldn't eat this? Putting doubt and confusion, what happened? Then the fruit was given to Eve. Then the fruit also passed on to who? To Adam. They had fell into the trap of the enemy. In other words, does God really mean what he says? And that is what we do today. Yes, we say, oh, we believe, but do we tremble like the devil and all the demons do? We 
just say, yes, we believe, but we don't tremble because we don't believe in the God of the Bible. We don't believe in what he says because if you believe in what he says, you would also tremble in his sight because he is powerful. And when he's with you, you will also be effective for his kingdom. And the plans of the enemy will not be against you. He says, and on this rock I'll build my church. What is that? It's not just the apostle Peter is the Catholic thing. It is the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. When he says, who do you say I am? He says, I know you are the son of God, the Messiah. And he said, flesh and blood has not told you that. You may believe, but do you tremble? Because if you have the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, you will know that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So when the devil keeps on coming and coming and coming, you say in the name of Jesus, be gone. And you'll do it again tomorrow. You will do it again the next day. You will you will get rid of those negative thoughts from your mind. Oh, did pastor say that to encourage me? Did pastor say that? I'm talking to every single person on YouTube. God is saying, wake up. If you get offended by these little things, then help me, God. Maybe you don't believe because if the demons believe and they tremble, why do we not tremble in the presence of God? He is a holy God. The Bible says, do not fear them. They can harm the body or say bad words to, but fear him. Fear God. That's the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. So God wants to empower us. The demons are still going to go to church today. And still trying to cause people to doubt God's word. That's why when you go to church, if you're not listening, if you're not abiding, and if you don't go and be a doer of the word, and also review the word... Get in there. Listen to Pastor Robert's message. You may have missed the scripture. You may have missed something because you were distracted by something in that technology. Isn't it? Because we get distracted by the devil. The devil are still going to go to church today and still try to cause people to doubt God's word. Many controversies are being spoken by the pulpit today, bringing confusion. As I was saying before, Saying, oh, this church doesn't believe in the gift of tongues. Though there were a Pentecostal church, what's going on in the church of Jesus Christ? When you hear those things, that must put up a radar to say, hallelujah, what is going on? You must be challenged in your seats. You must be trembling at the word of God. The word of God has power. You know what will judge us on that day will be the word. The word, the living word will judge us on that day. Oh, but pastor, I only like reading the words in red because Jesus, no, the whole word. It is the inspired word of God through the Holy Spirit. Too often. We debate the meaning rather than living out the intent of God's word. I said before, we read, we believe what we read. That's what people do. Rather than believe what they read. That's what we need to do. We need to believe whatever we're reading through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because when God is talking to you through his word, it's the most connected time you can have through God and the Holy Spirit. People are given false prophecies left, right and center. Stay in the word of God. Even when you hear prophecies, there will be a portion of that. It may be 90% right, 75% right. You take what is true and disregard the other. Because we all speak in part. Prophecy speaks in part. Never the fullness. Before you can hear the voice of God, you must have a relationship with the Word of God. Otherwise, confusion will come in. Confusion, and you will get led astray by other voices. Easily. I've seen that happen. Too often we debate the meaning rather than living out the intent of God's word. 
man has fallen into the trap of becoming a hearer only. And James 1.22 says, but be hearers of the word and not just doers. You can't have a relationship with God unless you have a relationship with the word of God. Otherwise you'll be deceived. And don't give me that excuse, I can't read, and no, no, no. I've heard stories of people that never read before that were illiterate. All of a sudden, God can make them read the Word of God. If you desire it, it will happen. I'm telling you, it's the truth. Because the Spirit of God enables you to do things you couldn't do before. Because when the anointing is upon you, that's what breaks the oath. Discouragement, another big one. When we go through difficult times in our marriage, our relationships, in our workplace, we become discouraged. When we start to discourage, we start to complain. Right? Complain, 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 complain. And what happened to the Israelites? The curse came upon them through the serpents that came to bite them until they were dead. And so it is today. We've got to remove all those discouraging thoughts from our minds. Let's look at Hebrews 10.25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching of the coming of our Lord Jesus. Did you notice the focus on this passage is more to do is not just merely meeting up and having a social club because today you can go into churches and leave exactly the same way. No, it says its focus is that you would encourage one another. You would encourage them to prepare for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the practical reasons for this scriptural command is to counteract the devil's strategies of discouraging the believers. There's a spiritual truth in here that's telling us, hey, this is how you're going to combat the enemy's attacks of discourage. Encouraging one another with scriptures, with psalms, with worship songs, telling them, hey, I had this vision, I had this dream, whatever it is, tell them the encouraging things that the Lord is coming back soon. Not pie in the sky things. Oh, I saw a blue elephant. The person's going like this. What has that got to do with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Absolutely nothing. And that's the type of hairy fairy prophecies we're getting today. Come on. Church of Jesus Christ. So here we see a faithful Christian, many a faithful Christian, who has withstood the attacks of Satan in the area of morality, truth, and righteousness, and righteous living, has found himself blindsided by discouragement. Even the best of us can become discouraged. What happened to Elijah? One minute he's slaying all the false prophets, the next thing you know he's going off, feeling discouraged and wants to commit suicide. Because Jezebel was after him. What is going on? We must maintain a steadfast walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not allow the news of things to rob us of our peace. That's why we listen to the good news. Not the news on the channel. That will just discourage you. Stick to the word of God. Smith Wigglesworth never read the newspaper. He only read the word of God. Hallelujah. And look at all the miracles that took place. Because he was bringing the good news. He was exposing the strategies of Satan. That's why the dead were coming back alive. Because he dared to challenge God's word because he absorbed himself in the word of God. So, suddenly there is a down day. And that's what happens to all of us. Maybe a little loss of vision. Something makes us lose our peace and then discouragement sets in. Meaning, if someone's words, or if some situation, or the way someone greeted you in church, or they didn't look at you, or they didn't smell you, whatever it is that you want them to do, they don't do that thing and you leave discouraged. It's time to keep our vision on Jesus Christ. Imagine Stephen. He was being stoned. But he kept his eyes on Jesus Christ and he had a vision 
of the Lord. Hallelujah. He did not become discouraged. Even John the Baptist became discouraged and sent his servant to go and ask Jesus, is he really the one that we're waiting for? Because I'm about to get my head chopped off here. But Stephen, who was young and zealous and full of the Holy Ghost and was faithful to the end, he kept his eyes on the prize. And he, hallelujah, what a great example for you and me to be so on fire for God, to be faithful even serving. Because if you want to be used by God, you've got to learn to serve first. How can you be used by God if you don't serve someone else? It doesn't work that way. Doesn't matter how gifted we think we are. It is, there is a thing, a protocol. When Elisha saw Elijah, Elijah came and threw the cloak upon him, which represented servanthood. But because of his faithfulness, even the kings knew he was the one that poured water for Elijah. But something transferred to him. The other prophets were there. There was a school of prophets said, hey, this person's going to be taken from you today. There are other prophets today that don't want to go deeper with God. So what some lady said, not only can you preach, but you can also move in the power of God. That's only because you spend time with the living word of God. And you said, devil, I'm not going to give up. It's a battle. These things did did, did fall out of the sky. It took persevering, persevering, persevering. Devil! You're not going to do this. Cancer does not have a right in the church of Jesus Christ. Because it is a spiritual thing. But today, people are just accepting it. As it's normal. Everything is acceptable. It's acceptable to have homosexuals playing in the worship band. It's acceptable today to have gay marriage. What is going on? Because we've come away from the word of God. Elijah felt depressed. What's the other one? The other plan of the devil is to bring offense. To bring offense against you. The Bible says in Proverbs 4 verse 23, Above everything else, guard your heart. Because from it flows the springs of life. Guard your heart, people. How do we guard our heart? In the Word of God, when you abide in Him. If you're being offended by every little thing that someone says to you, how are you supposed to come up against the devil? I can tell you now. Because when we go on these missions, it the fight against the devil is strong. And if you're not strong spiritually, you will get chewed up. It won't touch me, but it will touch you. I've seen people seek majorly because when you're coming up against the devil, you're a threat to him. He will keep the weakest link in us. He will always try to do it, but you've got to stay strong because he'll keep on coming and coming and coming. If you can't handle the coming and coming in your workplace, if you can't handle the coming and coming in your marriage, in all the other different places of your life, How are you going to be able to handle bringing revival to a city? Because you will be a threat to the devil. Not just the little devils, but the principality devils. And they will come like anything, if they can. So you've got to be able to learn to stand against the enemy. Hallelujah. Matthew 18. The whole of Matthew 18. He spoke to Peter. Peter said, how many times must I forgive my brother? He didn't say, how many times must I release someone that's offended me, you know, or that I've offended. He said, no, that those ones that have hurt me and I'm innocent. Seventy times seven. That means you don't even have a right to be offended. Do you understand? This is the word of God. This is not our feelings. And he says he gave the example of the unforgiving servant who was forgiven all of their sins. But when it came to the point of remembering a debt that someone else owed him, he nearly beat that person on the road. And the servant sort of, the angels are taking record of everything we do. And goes back to the father, goes back to the son. 
what happened? There was released upon him tormentors. If you are being tormented by offense in your workplace, in your marriage, whatever relationship, it's because you've opened up a door for bitterness and offense in your life. He says, I will release you to the tormentors. If you're being offended by everything, deal with that spirit of offense. Close the door. Otherwise, you'll never be used by God. That's the truth. Because something will happen. And that's the level that you'll be able to work at. And you don't want to go any higher than that because that, that attack will be more. That's right. I wouldn't even wish that on someone. That's why when I say, hey, man, you're not ready. You've got to grow in the Word of God because you've got to be able to withstand the attacks. I'm not just talking about sensing the presence of, of evil in the house. I mean complete attacks when the agents will come in person. How will you be able to combat that? Without authority. He says, Paul, we knew. Jesus, we knew. Who are you? You've been running for your life. When the possessed man, there was a possessed man in the Philippines. And I saw him walking up and down the road. And I saw he had this chantment thing around his leg. And the Lord said, pray now. When I left and came back, the, all the house was locked. But they saw on this white floor the black footprints of this man that had astro projected into their house and walked in the house up and down and left that place. And when I came back to that place, I started to warfare. Who was outside the house? This man. Everyone else not. This man is just a crazy guy. You don't understand. When the devil possesses you, he will use you to do the wicked things on this earth. They're not just, you know, they are used. That's why when the people get into a certain area of, of black magic or witchcraft, they go crazy, but they're, what they are is fully possessed, used by Satan. How are you going to handle that? Because that's what it is. We become a threat to the enemy. The enemy's kingdom knows who you are. They know the authority you carry. When I saw him, I said to the man, go and get that man. But he took off straight after. I went into the place, into the shop. This man walks up and down that place all the time. Those people that are being oppressed in that house is because of the witchcraft against this man. And I went in there and gave of Jesus they got up and walked. And he came that night. That night he came into the other house. And walked in and out. And I said, we need to anoint this house. We need to spiritually cleanse it. While I was doing it, who was outside? He was there. But he wasn't there the next day. He was gone. Greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. I'm not just saying these things to scare you. I'm saying these things that if you want to be used by God, you want to go to a higher level, then you need to go and fight and fight and fight until the very end. Proverbs 18 verse 19. An offended brother is more unyielding than a fortified city and his disputes are like the bars of a fortress. You know, to win over an offended brother is more difficult than bringing revival to a city because of offense. If you are offended about things, deal with it from the root. Otherwise, it will catch you on that day and you'll find yourself left behind and you'll be like, oh, I should have dealt with that. But no, this is not just about that being ready. It's about what you being effective in the kingdom of God. The Lord showed me this thing, and it was a carnival. And in that carnival, the enemy was there. You know, you see those carnivals or the royal show that we call it here in Australia. Maybe other places you call it something else. They have all the fancy rides and all those, you know, ugly looking clown things and all the different things. And you, you play the games, you shoot the little things to get the things down. But I saw that Satan was having one of these stores. And in one of those stores, there were things that you could buy. You could, you could buy these things. And they were all different things. One was hatred, one was envy, one was jealousy, one was lust, one was deceit, pride, lying, and so on and so on. 
But there were two down the bottom that had no price on it. And then when asked what they were, Satan replied, one was a fence and the other was what? It was dis discouragement. Because discouragement and offense, when Satan was asked, why was there no price tag? He says, because they are the most effective to, to get the will of Satan and his schemes done. So we've got to understand that discouragement and offense are one of the plans of the devil. That's right. And they are very effective in the church. You get offended, you leave. You get discouraged. You think they're talking about you? I ain't talking about you. I'm talking to the whole of the church of Jesus Christ. Because somebody needs to tell the truth. You want to know how to win against the devil. You want to know how to heal your marriage. You want to know how to heal that situation in your workplace. Stop being so offended. Stop being discouraged. Stop playing into the hands of the devil. Hallelujah. So division. Satan wants to divide his church that they may what not be effective so we know that the plan of satan is to what is to come and bring division in the church so one of the most effective strategies of satan has been to bring about division in the church the body of christ it makes sense that the enemy would push to the splintered and try to split and bring the divided church since jesus desired the opposite. Jesus desired the church to be one. That they may know that you are one by your love, isn't it? But Satan doesn't want us to be all lovey-dovey. He wants us to be hating each other. He wants us to be jealous of each other. He wants us to be fighting each other. He wants us to be gossiping about each other. Someone that is praying for you will not gossip about you. But someone that's gossiping about you will not even add you to the prayer list. We must pray for one another. Lord, change them. And the Bible says we heap coals upon the head. Love is the key. Love is the answer. But the true love of Jesus Christ, not the other love. Because that's only until you get offended. And then that very boy that you were so madly in love with, now you want to divorce him. That wasn't real love. The only real love is through Jesus Christ. Then you will have a long-lasting marriage. Will there be difficulties? Yes, there will. But you've got to learn because the devil's going to be like that energizer battery coming back and back and back and back. We've got to be strong. Mark 3, verse 24 to 36 says, If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, it will not be able to stand. When we are divided, the house will fall. You know, I've, I've just come back, I've heard the biggest ministry in the Philippines was divided. Because when the overseer passed away, there was a division because the person he appointed to be the overseer, the wife of the deceased person, so hang on a minute, I don't want to give away this power. So the, that church collapsed. Where is it today? It was very effective church. They were soldiers of God reaping the harvest. When that church crumbled, all the other churches have never been effective like that one. Had a very good thing. Everybody was working. You would be, they would have people specifically to make sure that you call on people. So if you didn't attend church, you would get a call from Pastor Corey. Not from Pastor Rob, you get Pastor Corey. And then Pastor Matt would do something else. And then Brother Ronald would do something else. And everyone would have their different role to be effective in the kingdom of God. Because we're all important in the kingdom, working together. But through one division and a power struggle, the church... <laughs> lost its power. It's lost its effectiveness. So the devil comes to deceive, to kill, steal, and destroy. John 17 verse 21. That they may be one, as we are one, Father, you and me and I and you, that they also may be one in us, 
that the world may believe that you have sent me. So our unity, we should do it for the sake of poor Jesus who went to the cross. Did he go to the cross in vain? For us to be fighting amongst one another, for us to be jealousy, to us to have power struggles? No! He went to the cross because he wanted unity in the church. Unity bonded by the Holy Spirit. Not a false unity of the postmodern Christianity that doesn't have the power. So when a congregation finds itself facing issues that bring division, the prayer meeting is far more effective than the first board meeting they call. We need to have a board meeting straight away. We've got a dilemma. There's no prayer anymore in the churches. And if not, they don't know how to pray. Because, oh no, the people are going to live, the money's going to go. How are we going to pay for this big auditorium? It's become a business. And we're not ministering to our loved ones or those of our loved one or their loved ones. If we have that mentality of ministering to our loved ones and the loved ones of others, Hallelujah. Maybe someone also would be obedient to go and minister to my family. You know, I'd say that to myself. Lord, send somebody to minister to my family. But the harvest is ready, but the laborers are what? They are few. Division always has a spiritual issue at its root. And our enemy, the devil, is always involved. Let me say that again. Division always has a spiritual issue at its root. And our enemy is the devil. Is always involved in that division. So, but the victory belongs to the Lord as we know. And the battle belongs to him. Hallelujah. But we've got to learn effectively how to not get caught in the schemes of the devil. Of the devices of the devil, isn't it? If we don't understand and we keep on hearing but we're not doing and we're playing into the hands of the devil every day, pastor can't do it anymore. All I can do is expose it. But until you actually get and read the word of God yourself, you know, it's going to take a holy girl slapping or something and it ain't going to be me because we don't do that. We don't battle against flesh and blood. I'm not here to slap people like that Catholic priest that was slapping the kids. No, I'm not going to do that. The conviction comes through the Holy Spirit. Though sometimes I think some people need a bit of a holy slap, but it's not my job to do. But the victory belongs to the Lord. And I'm convinced that our best defense against the devil is prayer. So if there are problems, if there are what? If there are divisions, if there are offenses, if there is discouragement, if there is doubt and deception, if there is a transferred growth to version, which is like postmodern church, sorry. Um, if it is hopelessness. What is the key? Pray. You don't need to be part of a big mega church. Just get on your knees and start to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Wow. You know, God is just waiting for someone that's willing to serve. He says, I have given you this example of washing each other's feet. That you may do the same thing. That we may serve one another. That's what it's about. Making ourselves available to serve one another. Are we serving each other the way that we should? We can always improve. All of us, even Pastor Robert needs to do better. Tie my days out. Prioritize different things. We all do. But do we love each other? Are we abiding in His love? So then we can abide in each other. We can't abide in each other if we aren't abiding in Him. It would be impossible. So how can we expect to have revival if we still carry all these schemes and we're playing into the devil's hands? You can't. You've got to deal with those issues. 
Allow the process of sanctification to change us, to consecrate us, to be worthy to carry his glory. Anybody can go around and pray with people. But the question I have is, do you qualify by your lifestyle, by your character, by your attitude in life? Because that's why he says, get away from me, I didn't know you. But Lord, Lord, I pray for people, I cast out devils. But if your attitude stinks, don't think you're going to be entering the kingdom of God. No way. He says, abide in me and abide with one another in unity of the Holy Spirit. I haven't got time to waste my energy on divisions, discouragement, offenses, because the end is soon. And that's why it says, don't forsake the fellowship of each other, but encourage one another because Jesus is coming back soon. Jesus is coming back soon. But, but brother, you're saying Jesus is coming back soon every day on Facebook, but you still have an offense with everybody. That, you can't do that. You've got to forgive, love. Maybe those people that are still... Stinky, you know, in, in Indonesia they have this thing called stinky beans. And it's like a delicacy, right? But maybe you think stinky beans is something else, but they have a bit of a smell, but that's nice, right? But I think some people have become a little bit like stinky beans, you know, to other people that don't want them. Sometimes you just need to surrender them to the Lord. Can, can you continue on the path? But don't block your heart. You've got to love one another. Maybe you become like stinky beans in Indonesia. To, to them, it's, it's good, isn't it? You, you know what I'm talking about? Stinky beans. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay, it could be Japanese. Maybe it's become popular. Yeah, like Korean food and so forth. So... So how the, maybe we just become stinky beans. And it's time for us to change the fragrance because we are supposed to be the fragrance of Christ, not the fragrance of stinky beans, is it? So we've got to have the fragrance of something. You know, you don't see perfume when it's being sprayed, but you sense it. I can sense when I meet people, if they're happy, if they're offended, if they're discouraged, or whatever it is. So we are to encourage one another. Hey, guess what, brothers and sisters? Oh, I don't want to come to church. You know, because there would have been everything trying to stop you even coming tonight. Oh, I can't be bothered. I'm tired. I've got a sore leg. I'll just sit down and have my tea. You know, all the different things. You feel relaxed. You've got a belly full of food. You know, and now the word of God is probably the least thing. You know, it says don't be, you know. Man should not live on bread alone, but every word proceeds from the mouth of God. So now your belly's full. How are you going to have an appetite for the word of God? You know what I mean? Like just, I'm just talking in general, like all of us. There are different little things that the devil will say, Oh, you've, you've had a hard week. You know? Oh, you've done so well this week. You don't need to go to Bible college or Bible study. You don't need to go to Sunday service. Or you've just had an argument. Oh, no, I can't go there. Oh, I'm a hypocrite. No, you've got to come and get on your face and say, God, change me. I don't want to leave you the same way. But no, what do we do? Oh, if I go to that big church, I just put on the smile. And then as soon as you get back in the car, you're back into that bad words or attitude. Because we're putting on masks. And the devil has what? He's captured us. We're playing into his hands. But the Lord is looking for people that will say, hey, God, just use me. I'm nothing. That's what he wants. He doesn't want anything. He just wants you to come empty. Empty of offense. Empty of all of those things. And if you get on your knees and say, God, help me with this offense, he'll help you. He'll change you. But if you don't see that there's a problem, then there is a problem. If you don't think that the devil is playing these schemes, then we have a problem. And that's what we do in the today in the church. Oh, they're just things that happen naturally. No. There's everything working. 
against you to make you a stinky bee. So you're not going to be very attractive to other people. But God wants us to be the fragrance of Christ. So Lord, let us just stand to our feet. Heavenly Father, I thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus. Even today, Lord, we want to come against the plans of the devil. Because the plans that he has, you know, just need to read the scripture here. We, we can see him. It says, you know, Galatians 5.24, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. You know, Ephesians 2 verse 1, it says, In your former life, you were living in offenses. So therefore, if we're getting offended in our new walk, we're, gonna, we're reverting to our old nature. 1 Peter 3, 24, uh, 22, Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Do you know what? All these little devils, they believe him and they tremble. And he says, I've given you all authority. Whatever you bind on this earth shall be bound in heaven. But some of us are getting caught up in offenses and everything else. You ain't got no more authority. He's just like, ha, 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 ha. I've just taken your authority. Colossians 1.16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So if we have that understanding, the devil, he lives under our feet. He was created by God, for God, to be under our feet. <laughs> the devil was created by God and for God to be under your feet. But is he under your feet or is he under your armpit? That's where the smelly beans is coming from, maybe. Who knows? So Colossians 2, verse 14 to 15, says, Blotting out the handwriting ordinance or agreements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having small principalities and powers, he made victory over them openly, triumphant them over them in it. All the forces of Satan are under his authority. That means that every plan of the devil, when you were in the world and the plans of the devil against you, they've been destroyed and nailed on the cross. So why are you allowing them to come back into your life? Galatians 2, 27 says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, the life I live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live this walk by faith. That faith is I'm not going to allow the devil. We're going to fight the good fight of what? Faith. So this spiritual battle is a fight of faith. So Heavenly Father, every person listening, that has offense in your heart. Maybe that's you today. Let, let us just say this prayer together. Just repeat this. Everyone together say, Heavenly Father, today we repent of any offense, any division, any hindrances, any blockages, any hopelessness, any doubt or deception, any discipleship distraction." in our lives that's not making us effective and we've been playing into the hands of the devil change us today we repent today we rededicate our lives to your son Jesus Christ as we invite him into our lives as our Lord as our God and as our personal Savior and from today we are born again. Help us, empower us, and give us the wisdom, the revelation, the understanding to overcome the devil, that we may be victorious. You said in your word, ask for the nations, and you will give them to us for your inheritance. So today, we claim the nations for Jesus Christ the hope of all glory that we will traverse the earth with this gospel to fulfill the great commission and see revival 
within the loved ones of our loved ones and of their loved ones and everyone's loved ones in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, we just thank you now. We give you all the praise. And we just thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray. Lord, for us in particular, if there's any offenses or anything in our heart, remove it from us. We don't want to leave here the same.